So here today, I will share some content on simple harmonic motion and oscillatory motion. We'll mostly, for the sake of this content, be focusing on simple harmonic motion. But in general, we'll discuss today what is oscillatory motion. And a lot of you have also heard of periodic motions or sinusoidal motions. Anything that repeats its motion or has sort of like a back and forth, that's what you want to think of when you think of something that is going to be in oscillatory motion. Again, the type of oscillatory motion we'll focus on is simple harmonic motion for the most part. What exactly is oscillatory motion and periodic behavior? Well, it is a system that moves back and forth, that is, oscillates between two points. What are some examples you could think of? Well, here are a few. Springs. In fact, a spring is probably the most common example often used to illustrate simple harmonic motion, one of which that's on a one-dimensional axis and without friction, as simple as we could think of. So that's what I will be using many times to illustrate oscillatory motion and simple harmonic motion. But that's certainly not the only object you could imagine that experiences oscillatory motion or periodic behavior. Swinging objects do as well. You could imagine something like a pendulum or something like a child on a swing. That seems to have some sort of periodic motion. And then how about air molecules in a sound wave? Those sort of vibrate back and forth. And again, it's a similar type of motion. You could even consider something like the changing seasons. Why do the seasons change? It's because the Earth tilts towards the sun in the local hemisphere, hemisphere summer. So what am I saying? I'm saying that when the northern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun, it's summer. And when the northern hemisphere is tilted away from the sun, it's winter season of the year. But those seasons repeat. And that's because circular motion has a period in the same way that oscillatory motion has a period. So something that's in uniform circular motion experiences similar behavior to oscillatory motion in that it has a period and it has a frequency and there's some sort of notion of amplitude and so on. So oscillatory motion, so oscillatory motion comes in many forms and the definitions are important before discussing the applications. And one thing I want to emphasize about oscillatory motion is that these objects always have what we call a restoring force. There must be a restoring force in order for there to be oscillatory motion. What exactly do we mean by this? Well, consider with the objects we've already mentioned, the springs. Spring has the spring force, which when the object is displaced from equilibrium, that's the force that brings it back towards equilibrium. Again, that's the so-called Hooke's Law spring force. What about swinging objects? Well, as long as they're in a gravitational field, which is why we expect them to be swinging, that restoring force should be weight. Now, by the way, that should be the weight in the direction of the motion, because there's gonna be a part of the weight that is, let's say, parallel or in, at least in the same direction along the same line as maybe the string of the pendulum. So we'll discuss that. What is going to be the restoring force for air molecules in a sound wave? Well, it's going to be the pressure, but air pressure is just force per unit area, and so it's still a restoring force. The changing seasons, that's actually going to be the gravity force because gravity is holding the Earth towards the sun and you can imagine that this is why the Earth experiences nearly uniform circular motion around the Sun. We know the motion of the Earth around the Sun to be elliptical, but there is some periodic nature to the seasons themselves. Okay, so always try to think about what is the restoring force anytime you come up against something that oscillates or something that has periodic behavior and periodic motion. Let us now consider a mass and spring system and its oscillation. So for a mass and spring system, imagine that you have a mass here initially displaced to the right, and then later its motion 
exhibits it to move to the left and then further move to the left, overshooting its equilibrium position. Let's assume this tabletop is perfectly frictionless. Let's define the positive x-axis to the right, and let's assume that when the object is displaced to the right, its position is positive, and then when the object is at some reference point, now by the way, this reference point we call the equilibrium position, Part of the reason we call that the equilibrium position is because this is the unstretched length of the spring. The spring has not been elongated nor compressed at all. And when the spring is to the left, the spring is now compressed, so x is a negative number, and we are to the left of the equilibrium position. Know the direction of the force, that is the spring force. When the object is to the right, the spring force is to the left. When the object is to the left, the spring force is to the right. But when the object is at equilibrium, the spring force is zero. So it seems that the greater the elongation, the greater the spring force. And if the elongation is in one direction, the spring force is in the opposite direction. So there should be a minus sign. And how strong the spring force is should depend upon well, how tight the spring is. And that's gonna be a spring constant. So we're, we're gonna assume something that the mass experiences a restoring force that tends to bring it back towards its equilibrium position. And ideal springs obey what we call Hooke's law. This is named after the English physicist Robert Hooke, who first discovered this. So spring force is equal to minus kx. This is kind of a linear equation which tells us how the spring force is related to the restoring force. Because, again, it's a minus because the spring force as a vector with direction is in the opposite direction of the displacement. And the displacement has a sign as well because that's a vector. And k is what we call the spring constant. It's related to how tight the spring is. The higher the spring constant, the more substantial the spring force is. And remember, this minus sign means the spring force and the displacement are in the opposite direction of each other. Systems with a net linear restoring force, in other words, Hooke's law, will oscillate with simple harmonic motion. This is something that's actually very important, so let me just define this. What is the definition of simple harmonic motion? Simple harmonic motion says that the restoring force is linearly proportional to the displacement. Linearly proportional, that's important. So if you, let's say, increase the displacement from equilibrium to twice, you should have twice the magnitude of the restoring force. When we have an object that oscillates back and forth, like this spring would go from elongated to zero in terms of its equilibrium position, then to compressed, and then it would continue, presumably forever, as long as there's no friction, this would be called a simple harmonic oscillator. And note that this is only true in the absence of dissipating or friction forces. So as long as we have no force that is non-conservative, that takes energy away from the mechanical energy, then we have a simple harmonic oscillator. So let's have a look now at what a simple harmonic oscillator looks like in terms of the motion in terms of the position of the mass at various important periods of time. We'll start off with looking at the mass at capital X. Now capital X is X max. That's the maximum elongation. It's also a positive number. Notice that the velocity is zero because we release the mass from rest. And even if this thing had gone on for a long time, the mass is about to turn around. Let's say it was moving to the right, now it's moving to the left. So we're gonna have the Hooke's Law spring force to the left, that is in the negative x direction, the velocity is zero, and the position is at its maximum x displacement. Sometime later, the 
mass will be moving through the equilibrium position. Notice that when we're moving through the equilibrium position, the speed is maximum. Now the velocity will actually be its most negative. That's what I mean by minimum. Now here I'm saying maximum velocity. I probably should have actually said maximum speed. But notice that the force is zero because at equilibrium, there is no stretching or compression. Furthermore, the position is zero. And again, the velocity is minus V maximum. Sometime later, and by the way, when I say sometime later here, I actually mean a quarter of a period later in time. So a quarter of a period later in time, the mass should move from x equal to zero to x equals negative x max. This is the place where the mass is maximally compressed. So when the mass is compressed, its displacement is negative. So this is negative x max. Its velocity is zero again. The object is about to change directions from moving to the left to moving to the right. Its force is maximum magnitude the Hooke's Law of Spring Force, and in fact, the force is at its maximum positive value because the force is to the right, and it's in the positive x direction. Panel D now shows the mass returning back to the equilibrium position, but this time it is moving to the right. So the velocity is V max. It's a positive because it's moving to the right. Again, the force is zero because we're neither stretched nor compressed. The position is zero, that's the equilibrium position, and the object is moving back to the right. And I know you're on the edge of your seat, but this motion should repeat. That panel A and panel E are exactly the same, that we return to the original position that we started this motion discussion with. Now, each of these motions to go from one picture to the next requires a quarter of a period of time. You might say capital T divided by four is the time it takes to advance between any of these frames. By the way, these are still frames. You could imagine that the time is fixed when we look at each of these snapshots of the mass's motion, but we note that this is simple harmonic motion in the absence of friction and any damping or air resistance or anything like that. Now, what exactly is periodic motion? I've already used some terminology, but I want to define that terminology carefully here. What is amplitude? Amplitude being capital A is the displacement from the equilibrium position. Think of the amplitude as half the distance from trough to peak. That's going to be in units of meters. Notice that? Here is the amplitude, okay? So notice that the amplitude is from the equilibrium position to the maximum point, or it's from the equilibrium position to the minimum point. You could also say, what's the distance between the minimum and maximum point, and then divide that by two to get the amplitude. So the amplitude is basically how far did you initially stretch the object from equilibrium, or compress it for that matter if you're looking at a mass on a spring. Now, what's the wavelength? Now, wavelength, even though I define it here, it's not going to be used all that much in these chapters because wavelength is more often dealing with traveling waves. So traveling waves move to some other location. Wavelength is often the symbol lambda, which is a Greek letter. It's the distance between wave crests or wave troughs, also in meters. It's shown here on this diagram, but again, we're not going to look at it very much in this course for these chapters. What about the period? Now, period is capital T. So period, capital T, is the time of one characteristic oscillation that an object takes. So that's going to have units of seconds. So the time it takes the object to go through one oscillation that would be the period. Notice that here we have, let's say, a mass on a spring, and we allow this thing to oscillate in simple harmonic motion. And let's imagine we have a pen which draws out what the oscillatory motion looks like. That's going to 
give us the period if we measure the time of one oscillation. Now last variable I want to define here is what we call the frequency, which is often given by lowercase cursive f. And that's the rate of repeat of an oscillation. So often we think of frequency in units of one over seconds. Now one over seconds is not actually all that useful per se. I prefer to say cycles per second or oscillations per second. But cycles or oscillations there and what I'm mentioning, those are both unit lists. And since those are both unit lists, what we do is we usually just ignore them in terms of the units. I would recommend you think in terms of cycles or oscillations per second, but it's not a real part of the unit. But the question is how often does an oscillation occur? If period is how long, frequency is how often, it turns out period and frequency, as we'll see very soon with the mathematics, they are reciprocals of each other. That is, their mathematical multiplication inverses. So, uh, frequency being units of one over seconds, or frequency being cycles or oscillations per second, we often give that a separate unit. So this unit is used so much that we just specify a new SI, or international system, unit, and we call this Hertz named after the German physicist Heinrich Hertz, who was the one who first experimentally came up with radio waves. So one Hertz is exactly one oscillation per second. It tells you how often the oscillations of the object are occurring. Now what I would like to do is I would like to take you through the mathematics of simple harmonic motion. The mathematics of simple harmonic motion tell us that if an object is in simple harmonic motion, that remember, the restoring force is proportional to the, dis to the displacement. So it turns out force and displacement are related through Newton's second law. Namely, the only force on, let's say, a spring in simple harmonic motion that has a mass if there's no damping, no friction, that's going to only be the Hooke's Law spring force equal to the net force, which we know to be ma, mass times acceleration vector, as long as the mass is constant, which we will assume it is here. So let's write down Newton's second law. Newton's second law would be that the net force is equal to the mass times the acceleration. Well, we know that net force is only minus kx from Hooke's law. And then suppose we wanted to be able to solve this equation. We might want to try to get one single variable. Well, acceleration is unknown, but acceleration can be written as the second derivative with respect to time of the position. Remember, acceleration is the time derivative of the velocity function, with, and then the velocity is the time derivative of the position function. So we can write this as m d squared v, sorry, d squared x by dt squared. So from this, we would get the following. We can use the second derivative with respect to time and Newton's second law and then for SHM, by the way, SHM is simple harmonic motion, it obeys this equation. What is this equation? Notice that we've divided by mass and we've reversed the direction of the equal sign compared to what I wrote up here. And whenever you see this, students, ladies and gentlemen, this is the differential equation for a simple harmonic oscillator. Notice that it's the second derivative of the displacement with respect to time is equal to some constant times the displacement. Notice that in this case, the constant is minus k over m times x. The minus suggests that it's a restoring force, brings it back towards equilibrium. And k over m is the important constant here. Now think about this. This is what we call a second order ordinary differential equation. 
with constant coefficients. Second order, ordinary differential equation, constant coefficients. Now, if you haven't reached this point in your math career to solve this ordinary differential equation, you will when you take your first differential equations class. So I'm not going to go through the mathematics of how we come up with the solution, but I will say this. Think about a function, one of the simple functions that you've learned in your late algebra, trigonometry, and calculus careers, and think about a function for which you can take two derivatives with respect to time, and you get the exact same function back, except there's a minus in front and then some constant out front. Now think a second. Hopefully you said that should be either a sine function or a cosine function. Namely, sine of, let's call it, omega t or cosine of omega t. Now what is omega there, by the way? Omega is what you would call the angular frequency and it's the constant that's going to pop out twice because two derivatives of sine gives us sine back with a minus. Two derivatives of cosine gives us a cosine back with a minus, but then there's a constant that pops out. So those essentially solve this differential equation. So what we'll actually choose is we'll choose this for the solution of the differential equation. That x, the position as a function of t, is equal to a cosine omega t plus phi. Now let's talk about this solution. A is the amplitude. It's the amplitude of the displacement. It tells you how much you initially stretched the mass when we began the motion. Omega here is the angular frequency. Notice it will have units of radians per second. Why? Because the argument, that is, what's inside of these parentheses of this cosine function, has to be in radians. This is probably one of the first times that in a science context you've dealt with needing to use radians. But it's important that your calculator here is in radian mode. So if this argument is in radians, Omega must be radians per second for its units because when we multiply by time in seconds, we must get radians. Furthermore, what is this phi? Now phi here is what we all now phi here is what we often call the phase constant or the phase shift. I'll get to that here in due time uh, very soon. So here is omega. And notice that omega is going to be k over m with a square root. Now, why is that? Because think, if you take two derivatives of cosine, each time using the chain rule, we're taking the derivative with respect to time, the omega is going to pop out front. So twice. So omega squared will just equal to k over m. Thus, omega, the angular frequency, would be the square root of k over m. I already mentioned that a is the amplitude. And think of the amplitude as how strong or how much energy is in this oscillation. Phi, again, is called the phase constant. It's determined by the position of the mass at t equals 0. Notice phi also has units of radians because, again, it's in the argument. Now, a couple of thoughts here before we proceed. Number one, you may ask, why did we choose a cosine function, not a sine function? Good question. Turns out you could have chosen a sine function. There's nothing really wrong with that. However, most of the time in physics, especially when we're doing a spring mass system, or we're looking at, let's say, a pendulum, the trigonometric function that we choose is a cosine. Why is that? It's because typically we start the stopwatch when the object is at its maximum elongation or maximum angular displacement. I'm saying that cosine is a function that begins at its maximum value. It is convenient to choose the cosine function because cosine starts at its maximum value 
if that's indeed when the motion starts, because we can then set phi equal to zero, and that makes the calculating easier. Now, if you wanted to say start the stopwatch at a different time, then phi would have a different value. In fact, phi is determined by where you set t equal to zero. Notice if phi is equal to, let's say, pi over two radians, then you might as well change this to a sine function. Why a sine function? Because we know that the cosine of omega t plus pi will give us a sine function back. That's one of your trigonometric identities. So there's nothing special about cosine except that it's typically more convenient and it's definitely used more often in simple harmonic motion by people doing physics. Now one thing I want to communicate here is how does the amplitude, the spring constant, and the mass change uh, things like the period and frequency when you change them. So hopefully you've seen this in some of my earlier videos. In fact, I'll link to them up here. I did some intuition videos about simple harmonic motion, and I want you to take a look at those up there. But let's just go through these things uh, quickly to understand uh, what the effects should be. So interestingly enough, suppose you increase the amplitude. Well, it turns out that even though you increase the amplitude, you will have a larger amplitude oscillation and the mass will go further in the oscillation. But believe it or not, the period will stay the same and the frequency will stay the same. How do we know that? Because it turns out if you displace further, you have further to go. But if you displace further, you also have a larger force to do it. And you could imagine that one of the things from the previous slide was that mass times acceleration had an a in it from the a cosine omega t plus phi function and then x which was this was the displacement had an a in it a would cancel on both sides so on one side of the equation we have second derivative with respect to time so what that should be is that should be minus omega squared times a cosine omega t plus phi. And then on the other side of the equation, what did we have? We had, well, minus kx. So it was minus k times this same function, a cosine omega t plus phi. Notice that this canceled. Again, we could have used cosine or sine. But then notice that the amplitude cancels. And since the amplitude cancels, you can see that the amplitude is unimportant as it relates to period or frequency. Uh, by the way, I did forget a mass here. So this should have been m minus m omega squared. Sorry about that. But yes, there should have been mass times acceleration, right? So m times omega. But let's see, uh, I think we going to divide and we could divide and get omega squared is k over m. Now the question is, this is the angular frequency. The angular frequency looks like it depends upon the spring constant and the mass. So let's talk about this. When we, let's say, increase the spring constant, notice that when the spring constant is increasing, you could imagine that the angular frequency is also increasing. So that means the frequency should increase. But if you have more frequent motions, that means the period should decrease. So why decrease? Because, well, if the oscillations are more often, they take less time. And just the opposite all the way around would also give a similar effect in the sense of if you decrease the spring constant, you would decrease the angular frequency and then increase the period. 
And let's try to think about why. A larger spring constant means it's going to be a tighter spring. In other words, it's going to have a larger restoring force. If we have a tighter spring and a larger restoring force, you'd expect that there should be, well, um, less time for the oscillation to occur and a higher frequency oscillation. How about the mass? Well, what happens when we, let's say, increase the mass down here, then I think the frequency should get less because we're increasing this denominator. So if we increase the mass, you should decrease the frequency, thus you increase the period. And let's think about why that is. If you have more mass to move with the same restoring force, the same spring, you would expect that there should be less acceleration. That is, there should be less uh, frequency because it's harder to move that mass. That mass has more inertia. And as a result, we have less often of the oscillations and they take longer. So the other way around is also true. You can increase you, the frequency. You can increase the frequency if you decrease the mass. And you can decrease the period if you have decreased the mass. OK, so hope this makes sense. What would a plot of position versus time for simple harmonic motion look like? Well, it should look like this. It should look like a sinusoidal wave. Notice this wave has no damping. It maintains a constant amplitude. It has a constant period, and thus it has a constant frequency. Notice the period is the time period from peak to peak or from trough to trough. So it's the time one oscillation takes. And notice that the amplitude is the displacement from equilibrium to the maximum or from equilibrium to the minimum. But note that the actual x value is positive when this curve is above equilibrium. And this x value is negative when this curve is below equilibrium. So we're plotting the position versus time. How do we get the period that is the time period, capital T, for one full cycle. The period is going to be given by 2 pi divided by omega. Let's think about why this is. So you can imagine that period is inversely through reciprocals related to the frequency. The higher the frequency, the shorter the period. And then vice versa, the smaller the frequency, the longer the period. Notice that omega has units of radians per second. 2 pi, you could sort of imagine, has units of radians. So radians divided by radians per second is going to give you seconds. That's the period, the time period, for one full oscillation. Now consider, 2 pi is the number of radians, at least in radian space, not in time space. But at least in radian space, we have to cycle through 2 pi radians to get through one full oscillation. The angular frequency is how often we cycle through radians. That's why it's units of radians per second. So if we divide how far divided by how often, we should get how long. That seems to make sense. Now notice, at least for a spring, omega is the square root of k of rem. So if you want this for a spring, it's 2 pi square root of m over k is the period of a spring in simple harmonic motion. Now what about the frequency? Notice that the frequency, again, is oscillations per second and its units of hertz. Frequency is just the reciprocal of the period. So the longer the period, the shorter the frequency. So the longer the period, the smaller the frequency. So the oscillations come less often. So notice that if you take the reciprocal of 2 pi over omega, you get omega over 2 pi. In fact, that's a useful relationship. What's the relationship between f and omega? Well, f is omega over 2 pi, 
or you could say 2 pi f is omega. That's how you can get angular frequency in terms of frequency or vice versa. And then again, omega is the square root of k over m, and notice that we get 1 over 2 pi, square root of k over m, is the frequency in hertz of the actual oscillator. Now, period and frequency of simple harmonic motion, what do they depend upon? They depend upon the stiffness, that is the force constant, k. Remember, this is the Hooke's Law spring constant. So the stiffer the spring, the higher frequency the oscillations are, so the shorter the period. And the mass of the system. If you have more mass, the system is more sluggish. The oscillations are less often. You lower the frequency and increase the period. But it does not depend upon the amplitude, however. And I already proved that to you mathematically. You can cancel out that A. So now let us summarize the wave representations with maximum values of simple harmonic motion. Let's look at the position versus time for simple harmonic motion. We already know what that curve should look like. X sub t is equal to A cosine omega t plus phi. Notice that this is a single variable function and it solves that ordinary differential equation, which is only a function of time. So a is the amplitude, cosine is the function we have chosen, omega t plus phi, this argument is all in radians. Omega is the angular frequency, t is time, phi is the phase shift or phase constant. Suppose you want the velocity versus time for simple harmonic motion. Well, you take the time derivative of the position as a function of time. So if you do that, you get minus v max sine omega t plus phi, because the derivative of cosine is sine, with a minus out front. And then a times omega, why a times omega? Because you have to use the chain rule when you do this derivative. The chain rule of this with respect to time brings an omega out front. So a times omega gives v max. And think about why that actually makes sense. Angular frequency is in radians per second. Times meters, which is the units of amplitude, gives you meters per second. And that's the SI unit for velocity. But notice that that's because radians get swept under the rug. Amplitude a was in meters. Notice that the higher frequency oscillations you have, the faster they occur. That should make sense, because if you have high frequency, it's sort of like a violent oscillation, and you should have larger velocities at play. And what's the plot going to look like? Well, if this plot, if you will, looks like a cosine function, this plot should look like a negative sine function. So when cosine's at its maximum value, sine is at zero. When cosine's at its minimum value, sine is at zero. But notice when the cosine function is going down, in fact, when it's going down at its maximum slope, the velocity function is at its most negative. And think about why that is. That's because, think about what's the derivative of this with respect to time. What's the slope of this curve at any time you'd be interested in? And if this is a negative slope, that negative slope gives you a negative value for the velocity. Another way to say this is that when the object is moving left, its velocity is negative. That's because its position is changing from positive to negative. Notice that the reason it's a negative sine function is because if this started at its maximum value, this started at zero, this went down, this also went down, but again, a typical sine function would start by going up. Okay, and then what about the acceleration? Well, the acceleration should be the time derivative of the velocity function. So that should be another time derivative. So the derivative of sine, with respect to time in this case, is going to be a cosine, and another omega is going to pop out front. So you'll get minus a max cosine omega t plus phi. Notice a max, the maximum acceleration, is omega squared times a, because there are two omegas to pop out front. So again, higher frequency oscillations 
should have greater accelerations because again they're more violent oscillations if you will and you can see that if you were to let's say double the frequency you'd get four times the acceleration now what's a negative cosine function going to look like well it's going to kind of look like this function except upside down in other words a reflection across the time axis so that's exactly what we see when we're at the point where we're maximally elongated that's when x equals x max first of all the speed is zero but then the acceleration is maximum and negative that's because the Hooke's law spring force is maximally negative when we're moving through the equilibrium position the velocity is then negative because we're moving left but the acceleration is zero because there's no Hooke's law spring force when we get back to fully compressed x equals negative x max the velocity is back to zero the acceleration is maximally positive when we move back through the equilibrium position notice the derivative here is positive that gives a positive value for the velocity but notice the derivative here is positive but what about the concavity well, we're changing from concave up to concave down concave up is going to give you a positive acceleration that's right here but then we're switching to concave down because this is a so-called point of inflection and then that is when the acceleration is zero again because we're not elongated or compressed moving back through the equilibrium position finally when we're back to maximally elongated we just repeat the process again okay so this is simple harmonic motion. I hope you understand how this works. I will show, look up here, this problem in a separate video, and I'll solve this problem uh, for this particular simple harmonic motion. So um, take a look at this problem. Again, look at the link up here, and hopefully you can follow along in a separate video. But here I'm gonna move on. Let's talk about energy in simple harmonic motion and the concepts. So in simple harmonic motion, that has the absence of friction, the mechanical energy is conserved for a system oscillating as such. Given that this is the case, we want to say that the kinetic energy of the mass m in simple harmonic motion is just going to be capital K equals one half mv squared. It's exactly what we've seen earlier in this course. It's just one half times the mass times the velocity squared. Now remember, when you square a velocity, it's always positive. So kinetic energy is a positive definite quantity. It's either positive or zero. Now, what happens if you fill in that velocity function from the previous slide? Well, you fill in that minus V max times sine omega t plus phi. So if you fill that in and V max is omega times A, you get one half m omega squared a squared sine squared omega t plus phi. So this is what the kinetic energy function looks like. Notice that it's a sine squared function. This will always be positive or zero. How about the potential energy of the spring and mass system? It's one half kx squared. The potential energy is the so-called elastic potential energy or the spring potential energy. So you're going to perform one-half times k, k being the spring constant, times the displacement, which is x. But we know what that function is. That's a cosine omega t plus phi. And we have to square it. So we get one-half k a squared cosine squared omega t plus phi. So notice it's also a positive definite quantity because it's either zero or positive when you square something. And in fact, a cosine function is again, a cosine squared function is always positive or zero. Now, what about the total energy? The total energy should be the mechanical energy. It should be the sum of the kinetic plus the potential energy. So the total energy should be one half K A squared. Why is that? So if you were to add these two functions together, you would take this and add plus one half m 
omega squared, but wait a second, omega squared is equal to k over m. Now the reason that's useful is because if this right here is k over m, we can get the m's to cancel. So we would get one half, and again, this m is gone. Now we have k a squared sine squared omega t plus phi. But wait a second, one half k a squared is common to both of these terms. So we have one half k a squared times cosine squared of omega t plus phi plus sine squared omega t plus phi. And now this is what we often call the Pythagorean identity, sometimes called the fundamental identity of trigonometry. In fact, this always gives you one. So that's why we get this value. So one half k a squared. So hopefully it mathematically makes sense, but let's think about physically why it makes sense. Physically it makes sense because the total energy put into the system depends upon what was the initial spring constant, which should remain constant throughout the motion, and what was the initial amplitude? Let's say we stretch it and then we let it go at time zero. The initial amplitude squared tells us the energy of the system. What do the energies look like as functions of time for simple harmonic motion? Well, notice that as a function of time, Suppose we start off maximally elongated, again, like a cosine function with phi equal to zero. If that's the case, then we have all elastic potential energy, one half k a squared. Notice that this is gonna oscillate like a cosine squared function. Notice that it's oscillating like a cosine squared function because it's actually oscillating with twice the frequency, in some sense, like compared to the other thing because, well, it's a square, okay? But notice that the kinetic energy starts off at zero because we're maximally elongated. The speed is zero. When we're moving through the equilibrium position, we're at a quarter period. And when we square that maximum speed, we get the maximum kinetic energy and then we go back down to zero kinetic energy. Why? Because we're maximally compressed, and now all the energy is in the elastic potential energy. But notice, anywhere, any time you choose, anywhere, if you add those two energies, it's just a constant number. That is, the mechanical energy should remain constant this entire time, as a function of time. What if you want to examine instead the kinetic energy and the potential energy versus position as opposed to versus time? Well, u is 1 half kx squared and k is 1 half mv squared. So at x equals x max or x equals negative x max, which are a and negative a, you will get uh, the maximum potential energy. That's the elastic potential energy. At x equals zero, you'll get the maximum kinetic energy. And notice that this is an upward facing u. That is the potential energy. The kinetic energy is a downward facing u, okay? Now, by the way, do you notice this special point? There's a special point in space and there's a special point in time where the kinetic energy and the potential energy are exactly the same. And I'm not gonna go through the mathematics because it's pretty rigorous, but if you use conservation of energy, you can actually derive what is the position and how is that related to the velocity. You can actually, instead of having position as a function of time or velocity as a function of time, you can actually get velocity in terms of position. This is a very useful equation at times. So the velocity can be expressed as plus or minus omega times the square root of a squared minus x squared. And I hope that makes sense to you. Why? Because right here at a or negative a, when we square, we have zero velocity. 
But right here, when x is zero, you'll get the maximum speed. So it'll be a plus or minus in terms of the velocity. It just depends upon which direction the uh, mass is going at the, at the moment. So here is a summary of simple harmonic motion. Here you see the time in quarter period increments. You see that the x position varies from a to zero to negative a to zero back to a. The velocity goes from zero to minus omega a to zero to omega a to zero. The acceleration goes from negative omega squared a to zero to omega squared a to zero and then minus omega squared a. Kinetic energy goes from zero to one half k a squared to zero to one half k a squared to zero. And the potential energy goes from one half k a squared to zero to one half k a squared to zero to one half k a squared. Notice when the object is elongated, we have maximal acceleration, maximal potential energy, maximal displacement. The only thing that's different here is the sign, S-I-G-N, of the x and the acceleration, but the potential energy, because it's squared, remains the same. And then this looks exactly the same as t equals zero. When we're moving through the equilibrium position, whether to the left or to the right, the kinetic energy is maximum and the speed is maximum, but the velocity, the direction just depends upon if we're moving left, that's negative, or to the right, that's positive. So I hope that you can understand how this works.